We're good. We're on. Well, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Sandra Davis, and I am an artist here in Gaithersburg, Maryland. And I want to welcome everybody to our Why I Vote panelist discussion. And I uh, wanted to take a few minutes to talk a little bit about the importance of our August 18th, uh, 2020 was the 100th anniversary for the women's right to vote and the ratification for the 19th Amendment. In commemoration for this historic event, the city of Gaithersburg has been presenting the Women's Suffrage Centennial Series, including educational programs and an art exhibit exploring the women's suffrage movement and voting rights. Um, the Why I Vote exhibit um, was a passion project of mine uh, that I actually began exploring in 2018. As a member of the Women's Caucus for Art here in the DC area, I felt really, really strongly about we as women artists who live in this area should some way, shape or form be participating in this celebration. So with uh, knowing that our national organization has a tenant that says that we will be involved through our art in social activism, women's rights, that sort of thing. So it was really, really important that we as a group here in the DC market participate. So, I wanted to make sure the word inclusive and included was part of this theme. And so we wanted to make sure that not only did we have work that was submitted through a jury process, but also invited guests. This way we would ensure that we did include as many women artists as possible in this exhibit. When I first started, um, looking around, looking for a venue, finding some partnerships. I was having some trouble doing that until January of 2019, after having a solo exhibit at the Boer Park Activity Center, I turned to Mary, who was the gallery director at the time, and said, you know, Mary, I really wanna make this happen. Literally without a blink of an eye, she said, yes, we're gonna do this. We'll figure this out. Don't you worry about it. This exhibit is actually gonna happen. So through lots of assistance with Mary, great collaboration with our exhibition chair, Madison Bowles for Women's Caucus for Art here in DC, our VP and technology chair, Deb Walmer, we were able to get this exhibit done. I wanna take a couple of minutes to say thank you to my husband and my two boys who have been listening to me for the last two and a half years about getting this exhibit in place. Thank you all very much for that. And I also wanna thank all of the artists who submitted and who have supported this exhibition. Um, the work includes not just the topic of the 19th Amendment, women having the right to vote, but also things that we're concerned about today, immigration, civil rights, equal pay. And of course, into 2020, now we're looking at election year and a pandemic that's happening simultaneously. So we all know that the story is not always fully told in history books or what we may have learned in school. We know that women of color were not always in the forefront of this story, which was also why it was important that we included as many women in this market, uh, in this exhibit. So I thank you all very, very much um, who have participated. I wanna take a minute to introduce our panel. And um, we have Ann Burton, who is our guest juror from the Black Rock Art Center in Germantown, Maryland. We have Mary Weiss-Walthorn, 
who at the time was a gallery director for this exhibit. We have artist Lily Kack, Andrea McCluskey, Francine Stowe Sinkler, Rosa Ines Vera, and we have Elaine Apter, who is from the Women's League of Voters. Also Janine De Silva, who is from the National Association of Colored Women's Clubs. Welcome ladies and welcome guests. Uh, we're gonna start off with um, some words from Ann Burton, our guest juror. And Ann, you can take it away. Hi, my name is Ann Burton. I'm, as Sandra said, I'm the gallery director at Black Rock Center for the Arts right up the road from Gaithersburg in Germantown. We're also located in Montgomery County. And um, I, I wanna thank Sandra Davis and the Women's Caucus, Women's Art Caucus um, for the, from the DC chapter for planning this timely and thoughtful exhibition and for working with uh, a venue in Montgomery County um, to present it. I also wanna thank Mary Waldhorn, um, the curator for the city of Gaithersburg for inviting me to be the, the juror for the Why I, Why I Vote exhibition. Um, but of course, the most important group I want to recognize are the artists. Um, the call for entries uh, that the Women's Caucus for Art um, put out was, was open to members of the WAC, um, but it was also open to other women artists from across the region. Um, and I, I wanna thank all the artists who submitted their work for the exhibition, um, even those that were not able to be included. Um, the review and the jurying of the entries was a difficult process. I spent a lot of time viewing images and reading the artist statements. Um, and it was really exciting to see such a wide range of media um, in the works, exploring a broad spectrum of concepts and themes um, related to the, the prompt, the, the theme for the exhibition. Um, some were very personal um, and <clears throat> have some very powerful, powerful stories behind them. Um, I went back and forth several times and I had to make some tough, tough decisions to select the works that are included in the exhibit. Um, and all the choices were carefully measured and I offer sincere congratulations to all that were included. Um, I really enjoyed seeing new works by uh, artists whose who's, uh, work I, I know, um, artists I've, I've seen their work before, I've worked with them, but um, I also enjoyed discovering new artists whose work I was not familiar with before. Um, and I do wanna talk about uh, several of the works in the, the exhibition. It was really striking the, um, the image that you see on screen now um, is a painting uh, by Juliet Hossein. It's called In the Sequel. And it's an acrylic on canvas painting very meticulously uh, crafted. Um, if you uh, view it, view the exhibition online, you can zoom in and, and appreciate the detail uh, of her work. Um, if you have the chance to go and visit the Boer Park Activity Center, um, which I had the pleasure to do this week, um, you can see in person get up close, wear your mask <laughs> when you go and, and see it, but um, it's very impressive. But uh, it is a portrait of the artist's daughter um, and it is also, um, she is holding uh, as if she <laughs> had a you know, child's toy version of, of the White House in her hands. Um, but I, I thought this was a, a nice one to start with um, thinking about this being the centennial um, for the ratification of the 19th Amendment and thinking about all of the protests that took place and the women, the suffragists who stood along in front of the White House and uh, you know, spent so much of their time working so hard uh, to get that, get us the right to vote and having that happen 100 years ago today, we're very conscious of that and also the fact that we're um, we're in an election year and um, 
you know, thinking about the idea, but the concept for this painting, um, the artist was thinking about um, her daughter and the, her hope that um, we will someday have, have a, a woman as president of our country. Um, there are a number of other artists who, who focused on children as being part of um, the catalyst for their personal choice to vote, the responsibility that they feel um, to vote. Uh, Beth, Beth Altman um, has a, a photograph in the exhibition, um, which is uh, actually two children who participated um, in <clears throat> a protest. And they were um, actually at the, the March for Our Lives and very powerful thing that people are including, including their children in, um, in the protests that take place. Linda Lowry has a, um, a beautiful and caustic painting of, of three young, very young, <laughs> newborn almost um, triplet girls who are on a pink blanket. And you might think like, oh, it's just a, a you know, pretty picture of three little people, but I, I see it as a, a symbol for um, one of the powerful reasons that we have the responsibility to, to vote. And um, each time we have the opportunity to do that, we're, we're voting for ourselves, but also for the future, for the, um, the children and what will, what will happen to our country and things that will uh, affect them. Uh, Catherine Richards has a beautiful painting, um, an oil on canvas called Stone Age, um, which has a view of a young, um, a young boy, who actually was her son, um, wading in the water and picking up stones um, that he, uh, he remembers still now that he's 17, that scene um, of visiting and, and she was focusing both on, on his, his life, his experience, but on the environment. Um, and if you can switch to the next slide, please. Um, there are a number of artists who are focused on the environment in the work that's displayed. Um, Rosemary Fallon has three photographs that are actually framed and presented separately in the exhibition in a series, which is a, a, a title for each. Um, they're in a series for an, a homage to Rachel Carson. And they're actually um, scenes in a, a local um, Rachel Carson Greenway, which is in Silver Spring. Um, but I think it's very powerful the, um, in us thinking about you know, the inspiration and <laughs> the suffragists who uh, brought about the opportunity for women to vote, but um, the many other women have seemed to be inspirational to a lot of the artists who um, are in the exhibition. And Rachel Carson obviously was a great writer, a scientist, and is responsible for a lot of the uh, environmental changes, you know, alerting to climate change and um, the, trying to prevent, prevent things that um, are detrimental to our environment. And that's something that's very powerful right now and all of us seeing seeing horrible things happening um, with the wildfires and <clears throat> all kinds of um, effects from, from the policies that <clears throat> we do have, we do have a, a big responsibility when we vote to consider. Um, Megan King is an artist who uh, is in the exhibition and her piece Wade in the Water um, is a somewhat abstract, um, but <clears throat> very powerful. Um, mixed media piece that includes a photograph and is focusing on the effects of um, the choices that we make, the things that we buy and we use and <clears throat> um, the waste that enters our ecosystem. Deborah Walmer has a, one of the largest pieces in the, the exhibition um, called The Trees Are Calling. It's an oil on canvas painting of um, actually a, a scene um, close to where the, the gallery is located in the Seneca Greenway Trail. <clears throat> really striking piece that is helpful in reminding us of the beauty of our, you know, even in our local areas, we have to consider um, what's happening in our, our votes for the elected officials in our, our 
close area in our counties, um, in our cities, but um, also the bigger picture, the national stage. Madison Bowles has a, a, a mixed media piece called Empress, um, which includes collage and <clears throat> some very uh, beautiful layered and almost three-dimensional effects. Um, and she's focus, focusing on <clears throat> the assaults on our planet in her piece as well. Um, there are a few other environmental pieces. Bonita Tabakin has a <clears throat> very powerful mixed media painting that includes um, some layers of, of fiber in addition to the, the oil and acrylic um, paints on her canvas. It's called Monument Preservation. And Jane Pettit um, created <clears throat> a very striking um, piece that includes stained glass, uh, stones, and some uh, pieces of 24 karat gold in her night sky piece. Um, and she, she's focused on protecting the environment and <clears throat> um, it draws you in that piece. It has a very uh, ornate gold frame around it, but <laughs> um, because it has such a powerful powerful scene, you start to look at it and thinking about the, um, the landscape that she's created and the beauty of that, um, it's a powerful statement. <clears throat> and if you could switch to the next slide, please. <clears throat> a number of the artists are focused on um, using fiber art in their work. Um, and some of the artists are working uh, also in an abstract way. So I wanted to include this image of Jenny Wilson's quilt, which is um, a collage. There are several works that use collage in the exhibition. Um, and this one <clears throat> does not have a specific theme, um, but I do think that the idea of um, the layering and the connectedness and the way that the pieces are put together, um, it kind of has a reminder of all of our <laughs> responsibility and all of our interconnectedness um, that in our democracy, you know, everyone, everyone is important. We're all much more aware of how what we do affects other people right now. Um, and I thought <clears throat> this was a nice piece to, to highlight, but <clears throat> there are several artists who are actually um, making quilts and working with fabric and stitching in their work. Uh, Carol Williams, whose work you can view in the online exhibition, has two uh, very powerful uh, quilts that include <clears throat> one piece called the flag of the United States of ammunition. And she includes um, small metal uh, pistol buttons and um, some a, a little toy pistol on there. It's, it's a traditional looking quilt um, but has a very powerful message included. And Holly Stone, um, who works with embroidery on sheer fabrics, it's silk threads and um, all kinds of different layered <clears throat> mixed media, um, has a piece called Why Women Should Run the World. It's a, a smaller piece, but um, it draws you in with the, the words that she's written on the page and the imagery that she stitched. Um, with her threads. So you could switch to the next slide, please. <clears throat> Two other pieces that are in the exhibition that include fiber art and um, stitches and beading <clears throat> are the two that you see on screen now by Bonnie McAllister. They're quite small um, pieces. They were created, I guess, on an embroidery hoop, both of them on the left. We have Representative Ilhan Omar, and on the right, we have uh, Greta Thunberg. They're both portraits of um, women who are very active in helping to shape on, in our country and internationally um, to bring awareness to <clears throat> a variety of different, <clears throat> different concerns that we have, but they're, there are women who um, should inspire all of us in, in the work that they have done and 
the roles that they play currently in um, bringing awareness to issues that um, I, I find the, the technique that she used and the combination of um, the techniques that we often consider to be things that generally women would, you know, do embroidery and quilting. Um, I think it's a, a beautiful combination, but very, a very modern treatment of uh, quilting and fiber art work. There are other artists who um, have created pieces that are looking at very current um, concerns for women. And those are included in the exhibition. Kim Foley has a small but powerful piece called Keep Abortion Safe. Pauline Feudal Smith has uh, two posters in the exhibition. Um, they're graphic but beautiful pieces. Um, there's a piece called Vote, <clears throat> the 19th Amendment. Um, and then there are <clears throat> other artists who are working um, with, with themes that focus on food insecurity and other issues. Linda Andre has a, a beautiful painting called Survivor. <clears throat> Some of the artists um, chose, there are several beautiful paintings in the exhibition, but many of those are large. Um, Jeannie Sullivan has a painting called Lady of Letters. It's mixed media and includes um, layers of collage. Rosa Vera, who you'll hear from soon and see more of her, her painting called We Are Many and One, which is a very inspirational piece. And then Alicia Christie, who has a watercolor um, called Voting Matters. You can switch to the next slide. And the last piece I wanted to show um, is by artist Marla McLean. While the, the exhibition called for entries um, specified that the work needed to be uh, two-dimensional, meaning that it had to be hung on the wall because if you were able to go see the exhibition at Boer Park Activity Center, um, all of the work is hanging on the wall. It's beautifully arranged. Mary Waldhorn did a wonderful job grouping the pieces and um, there are some small groups and then uh, punctuated by individual pieces. But <clears throat> Marla's piece is extremely sculptural. There are several pieces that have layers and construction elements, but her painting um, is a painting um, actually of her son. It's called Protect Him. And it's made <clears throat> using an artist, uh, an artist toolbox, which includes a palette. So the painting is actually painted on a wooden palette. And you can see there's the typical hole where um, the artist's thumb would go to um, hold on to the palette as they work. You can see the handle on the right side there. And <clears throat> she, uh, she has a very powerful message in what she created. It's, it's a beautifully done piece um, and it, it holds a lot of a lot of meaning. You can see trinkets and um, prayer beads and um, vases and vials of things hanging down, symbols painted um, on the right there. But <clears throat> I think it's uh, a beautifully done piece, but it, it holds a, a lot of powerful messages. And um, <clears throat> I know all of the artists have um, included <clears throat> in their work very thoughtful um, explorations of different themes, but I found um, that Marley's piece, uh, this protect him as well as she has a second piece called too many vigils in the exhibition, um, which <clears throat> she had been attending vigils um, and she collected them um, and she wasn't sure what she would do with them, but they, um, she felt like there, there have been too many, too many vigils in this country. The, the second piece is actually called too, too many vigils. And she included the candles um, that she had saved. Um, and she was focusing, kind of inspired with the Black Lives Matter movement. <clears throat> um, that's part of her statement for that piece. Um, 
but I, I, I'm impressed with um, her work and the work of all the artists who entered the exhibition and I, I uh, congratulate them and I, I thank the Women's Caucus for Art and City of Gaithersburg for putting together this exhibit. Thank you so much, Anne. Um, it's always nice to hear the jurors' point of view and some of the things that you were looking for as we were putting this exhibition together. And um, I want to take a few minutes to have Mary speak about the importance of our collaboration with the city of Gaithersburg, in addition to the ability to have invited artists as well as the jury work as well. And okay, Mary, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Hello, everyone. It's wonderful to be here. It's wonderful to be able to have a collaboration uh, with the uh, DC chapter of the Washington Women's Art Caucus. It's, uh, it's wonderful to have, have chosen the right juror for this show because Anne certainly was very thoughtful about how she discussed the work. And I'm very privileged and happy to work for the city of Gaithersburg because the city is a very inclusive city, one of the most inclusive, diverse cities in the whole United States of America. And the three venues where we show art, which are the Arts Barn, the um, uh, Gaithersburg Mansion, and Borough Park, of those three venues, Borough Park is a community center. And in that venue, we always try our hardest to show work that will either educate, of course, about art, or we'll have, have some kind of uh, way of showing the, the inclusiveness and diversity of our community. So it was a perfect match for us to work with the uh, Washington Women's Art Caucus. Uh, so it's been a real pleasure. And, and Sandra and I have been working very hard on this for a year and a half. So it's fun to see it come to this fruition. I also wanna thank some people behind the scenes here today because certainly this is new for me, I wanna thank Jerry Donnelly and Jenna Ashman and Deb Walmer and Cindy Mahane for uh, doing the technical parts of this program because uh, without you, we wouldn't be here today. So thanks very much for all your help. Uh, on the screen, you see two pieces. And the first piece that you see is called U.S. Border Tragedy by Linda Slattery Sherman. Actually, when Sandra came to me in the Borough Park Gallery and asked if she could have the show, we were doing another show, uh, starting another show uh, called Building Bridges, Connecting Our Global Roots. And Linda had put this piece uh, into that show to be juried into the show. And, and when I saw the piece and I had talked to Sandra, I said, no, we have to definitely have this as part of our Why Our Vote exhibit. So Linda is one of our invited artists, as is Laura Kingsland. And Linda is usually an abstract artist, uh, did this piece, uh, because she has a daughter who is a teacher and her daughter was telling her about some of uh, the issues of the immigrant children she was teaching. And it was also done because at the time uh, it was during our terrible tragedy at the border with uh, children being separated from their parents. So it's a very potent piece and I'm very glad to have it in the show. Um, I wanna give a little shout out, as Anne said, there are some uh, pictures of children in the show and one that she, didn't mention was an invited artist, Leah Craigie Marshall has an incredibly not easy to view piece about uh, how children practice uh, drills for uh, possible having shooters come into their school. Um, that's also a piece that I wanted to, to give a little shout out for. And then Lauren Kingsland was, uh, uh, did a, uh, this wonderful quilt and she's gonna be teaching a, a little class at Montgomery County about doing this kind of quilt about why I vote and using words that have to do with uh, the importance of voting. Um, it was sad, but I hope in, uh, the, in maybe when the pandemic is over at our other two venues, we were supposed to have two sisterhood shows to go with this show. One was a painting show that was supposed to be at our mansion. And it was going to be a group of artists uh, who knew each other for the most part. and. Uh, so they would be paired off and they would have some of their paintings to show. One going to be a wonderful show. And Lauren was also going to be in, uh, have and be included in a fine arts, fine craft sisterhood show at the Arts Barn. So I'm hoping that in the future, when the pandemic is, is over and life goes back to whatever the new life will be in our wonderful country, that we'll be able to show 
that those th those exhibits. Now I will turn this back to Sandra. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mary. And um, I look forward to many more shows with us doing this together again. Um, so I really appreciate the support and the collaboration. Um, our next speaker is Elaine Actor from the Women's League of Voters. And I thought it was important to make sure that we told the story about why we're actually having this celebration and actually having this exhibit. So with that, um, Elaine, go ahead. Thank you, Sandra. Um, on behalf of the League of Women Voters, it's my pleasure to participate in this wonderful event. It took over 80 years for the women, at least the white women, to win the right to vote, much longer for women of color. But from the beginning, the fight not only included the white women that we normally see in pictures as suffragettes, but also black women, Native Americans, Jews, Hispanics, and Asians. These women picketed, marched, went to jail, and had hunger strikes, all to get the right to vote. They all knew the importance of that precious right. Lucky for us with the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment, there has been some wonderful research about the fight for women's suffrage and the role that women from all ethnic groups played in that fight. This research has produced some insightful new literature on the topic. Together they tell the story of women's fights for the vote beyond what you had in your history books, that is, if you had any. Why is the right to vote so important? Voting is power. Interestingly, the Constitution did not grant all citizens the right to vote. That was limited to white male property owners. And even then, they did not trust those voters to vote directly for president, hence the establishment of the Electoral College but citizens knew the importance and power of the right to vote, and the fight for it has been an ongoing battle. The 14th Amendment finally gave all white men voting rights. The 15th Amendment extended it to black males. And then the Voting Rights Act of 1965 finally technically allowed all citizens the right to vote. But without the constitutional right to universal suffrage, there is and has been throughout our history, the move to make it harder for certain people to vote. Once blacks got the vote, then you had to establish poll taxes, grandfather clauses, literally literacy tests, anything to put blocks in the way of blacks voting. The Civil Rights Acts made things pretty good for a while, until the Supreme Court ruling in Shelby versus Holder that eliminated preclearance for voting law changes in certain states and localities that had used voter suppression tactics in the past. With the preclearance requirement gone, we saw an immediate uptick in voter suppression laws from voter ID laws, purging of voter rolls, cutting back on early voting, eliminating polling places, or undermining the confidence in the voting process. The League of Women Voters has been involved in lawsuits all over the country fighting voter suppression laws. The fight for the right to vote seems unend unending, and you have to realize that if those in power thought that your vote was not important, we would not have all these voter suppression tactics. With the right to vote, to vote, though, comes responsibility. The League of Women Voters was formed to educate these newly franchised women voters on the candidates and issues in a nonpartisan basis. They are still doing that 100 years later. That responsibility to be informed voters is important now as it was in 1920. Does my vote count? Oh, a capital Y, a capital E, and a capital S. If you do not vote, you're giving your power to choose the person who is going to represent you to someone else. All candidates, especially in local races, have won with as little as one vote, also candidates. In presidential races, with the Electoral College winner-take-all rule in every state but two, a candidate winning by a few thousand votes in the state 
receives all those states' electoral college votes. But it's not just the right to vote that was important, it kind of was a baby step. It's fine to be able to choose your elected officials, but where does the power lie? In those elected officials. Therefore, that is where women should be. They should be the elected officials, the ones making the laws. We need a woman's perspective in all legislative bo bodies. The League of Women Voters first fight was for child labor laws. Women's health issues were virtually ignored until women were elected. Child care issues, equal pay for women, spouse abuse are just some examples of issues that are priorities for women that need a voice in our legislative bodies and as our executive officials. So I urge you to exercise that voting right that your foremothers fought so hard to obtain. Educate yourself on the issues and the candidates. And if you really want to have some say in the future, work for a candidate or issue of your choice. And better yet, if you can, run for office yourself. But right now, the message is get out and vote. Your vote does count. And I wanna thank you again the arts have always been in the forefront of facing hard issues. So I will turn it back to Sandra. Thank you so much, Elaine. Um, there's so much to learn and um, we're gonna keep this moving. And um, Lily Cack is our artist that's gonna be speaking about her work. Um, thank you, Lily. Um, if you could share your thoughts on this dual pandemic that we're currently in. Thank you, Sandra. Uh, I just want to thank everyone for inviting me. I am so privileged and honored uh, to be here and to be able to share uh, uh, one of my uh, uh, work, one of my pieces of work. So I would like to talk about my painting called Your Breath Counts, Vote for Change. My painting combines three significant historical events because today in 2020, history is repeating itself again. 100 years ago, the women's suffrage movement culminated in a historic hard, word, hard won right for women to vote. And we are facing one of the most consequential elections this year in 2020. 100 years ago, a pandemic swept across the earth, killing over 20 million people. And today in 2020, we are right in the middle of the coronavirus pandemic this year. 400 years ago, the first African slaves arrived, marking the beginning of the racial pandemic. And we are still fighting racial disparity today. Just a couple of months ago, when the pandemic swept across the world and the Black Lives Matter movement galvanized the US, I was struck by a core theme that ran through both the racial pandemic and the coronavirus pandemic the inability to breathe freely. In the streets, I could hear people shouting in anger, I can't breathe. In the hospitals, I could hear patients gasping because they couldn't breathe either. And what struck me is that our best hope to address both issues was to vote for change. So I put those concepts together in this painting and I'd like to go over it with you just to share with you what I was able to depict in my painting. So um, I hope you can see this because I want to sort of go over these concepts with you. The, the dominant color you will notice in this painting is purple and that was deliberately done. Purple, as you know, is blue and red. So really it's all about America, it didn't matter which state, which color you were loyal to. And then the focal point there are two people, a man and a woman. They're both kneeling, they're taking the knee. And I was just profoundly struck by the meaning and the symbolism of taking the knee. It's a nonviolent symbol of protesting against racial disparity. So these two people, a man and a woman, are right in the center as my focal point. 
And then I want to go uh, anti-clockwise from the top. On the top, you will see a coronavirus, a huge virus just floating out there up in the sky. And right below that virus is a patient in the hospital and a doctor next to him. And the patient is, breathe, is struggling to breathe. Um, and right in front of the patient is a, is a woman crouching in anguish and she's in purple. And right below her are two health providers. They're wearing their facial shields and their masks. And one of them is holding a card saying, your breath counts, really playing on the word, your vote counts. And right up on the top right are, is a woman and she's voting because that's, that's what it, we are banking on of, to vote for change. And above her, there's a rainbow and the rain, rainbow symbolizes hope and a wonderful future, a colorful, wonderful future ahead of us. So that is my painting. And I just wanted to share that with you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lily. Our next artist is Francine Stowe Sinkler. And um, her piece talks a little bit about prayer. And so if Francie can share some of her thoughts about her work. Thank you, Sandra. It's really a privilege to not only view the beautiful work that was created with this concept, but also to hear the thoughts and the ideas um, and the beliefs behind it. Uh, my piece is called Between Prayer and Protest. And when I was asked to create a work of art surrounded by the reasons why I vote, um, my initial thoughts were based in um, kind of why we do what we do in celebration of things, right? We honor the past, we look back to the past and um, thinking of my ancestors who fought for the rights of African-Americans to obtain the right to vote um, as citizens of this country. Um, but when 2020 hit, and I think it's going to go down as a year of significant transition for everyone. Um, the past and the present kind of came head to head and it seems to be a recurring theme I'm hearing um, from my fellow artists, but I really had to stop because it was a pivotal moment when I repeatedly started to realize that we were fighting for humanity and it was far from over. Um, when women achieved the right to vote in 1920, African-American women that were a part of that continued to forge on because although a few gained that right, the majority didn't until 1965. Um, and while the women's organizations, um, the Caucasian women organizations were disbanding after achieving that accomplishment, um, African-American women had to push on. Um, so between prayer and protest is the acknowledgement that we vote and it is significant, but we do it, we pause, we vote, and we keep pushing, we keep fighting. Um, in art, in the classroom, at work, um, at the polls, definitely, our voice as African-American women matters. Um, and although we hurt because of the anguish of our community, um, we keep speaking, we keep protesting, we keep praying for the well being of our communities, our families, and this country. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you so much, Francine. That's a perfect segue into our next guest, uh, Jan De Silva from the uh, Association of um, African American Women's uh, Colored Clubs. And so uh, Jan, I'm gonna turn it right over to you so we can stay on, on time. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra. Good afternoon, everyone. First, I'd like to give a big thank you to Sandra Davis and the Women's Caucus for Art of Greater Washington, DC and the city of Gaithersburg for hosting this art exhibit and inviting me to participate on behalf of the National Association of Colored Women's Clubs. 
Inc., also known as NACWC, which is what I'm going to call it during my presentation. Right now, I'm coming to you from New Bedford, Massachusetts, where I'm a member of Martha Briggs Educational Club, and I'm also the state president of the Massachusetts State Union of Colored Women's Clubs. We are affiliates under the NACWC umbrella. First, I wanna set the scene for what life was like for African-Americans during the 19th century. Uh, after the Civil War, we had 12 years of political freedom, economic freedom. I use the word freedom very loosely, but it was freedom compared to what came after 1877 with Reconstruction. The 15th Amendment had given African-American men the right to vote, but after 1877, with the uprise of the Southern white supremacist movement, those votes were no longer allowed. We had the institution of poll taxes, reading requirements, and men lost most of their rights to vote until the advent of the Voting Rights Act of 1965. As part of that, there was an increase in lynching. Ida B. Wells Barnett was researching lynching in Southern states and forced to leave Memphis for Chicago because of personal, th personal threats to her. And I'm using her to set the scene for what happens next. During this time, there was also an increase in Jim Crow behavior. It was a very oppressive time for African-Americans in the South and the North, where their legal status was constricted right before their eyes. A lot of African-Americans took educational opportunities. There were people who went to college. These opportunities were available, but not all could attain them. Women worried about their families and opportunities for their children. And African-American women were advocates of universal suffrage, but only able to do their advocacy through churches and community organizations because the National Women's Suffrage Association and the American Women's Suffrage Association were not friendly to African-American women as members and never had been even since the Seneca Falls Convention in 1848. So with all that setting the stage for why we needed an organization like that, the National Association of Colored Women's Clubs grew out of women who were active in their local communities, especially around the issues of, of children and education. There were, there were white women's groups who did the same thing. The Federation of Women's Clubs held conventions in Chicago, Philadelphia, and Louis, Louisville, but this all white organization failed to admit colored women's clubs as either full members or affiliates in spite of the fact that colored women were just as accomplished in many areas, being doctors, lawyers, college grads, teachers, businesswomen, or pursuing music and literary pursuits. The big bombshell of this time period was in, in 1895. John W. Um, right during, during this year, I'm kind of, I know. In 1895, Ida B. Wells had gone to England to speak about her lynching research and talk about lynching in America. Her hostess, Florence Balgarni, received a letter from John W. Jacks, the president of the Missouri Press Association in response to her invitation to Miss Wells. Part of Jacks' letter stated all colored women were prostitutes and natural liars and thieves who were wholly devoid of morality. This being said about colored women in the United States created an uproar. As a result of the letter, in 1895, Josephine St. Pierre Ruffin, president of the Boston's Women Era Club, made a call to confer across the United States to all colored, women, all colored women's clubs to address Mr. Jack's slanderous words. The three-day conference was designed, designed to consider the vital questions concerning our moral, mental, physical, and financial growth and well-being. And although the matter of a convention has, talk, has been talked about over some time, the subject has been precipitated by a letter to England written by a Southern editor and reflecting upon the moral character of all colored women. This letter is too indecent for publication, but a copy of it is sent with this call to the, all the women's bodies throughout the country. That's a quote directly from Miss Saint Pierre, Mrs. St. Pierre Gordon's letter. In 1895, women from 16 states answered the call and came to Boston and this meeting resulted in the National Federation of Afro-American Women. 
And this was not the only group of women who were meeting at this time. Oh, before I go on to there, uh, I just wanted to give you some more information about the Jack's letter. The reason why these women wanted to confer was they, they gave three reasons. They wanted to feel the chair and inspiration of meeting each other. They wanted to talk over those things that are of special interest to us as colored women, such as the training of our children, and we are a large and growing class of earnest, intelligent, progressive colored women who, if not leading full useful lives, are only waiting for the opportunity to do so, warped and cramped from the lack of opportunity. So, you know, they had a purpose for the meeting and quite a few women came. At this time, there were other women's groups. There was a second national group, the Colored Women's League, which was formed in Washington, DC to address some of the same concerns. And with the, these two groups meeting, they decided that maybe they would, it would be better if they were able to join up and form one organization. So in 1896, they held separate conventions and then realizing that there was more strength and unity combined to form the National Association of Colored Women. Clubs was added at a later date, with Mary Church Terrell being elected the first president. At that, con at that convention, 73 delegates from 25 states attended. Some of the major goals of the NACWC focus on the improvement of home life for colored families and the development of free kindergartens. Mary Church Terrell said in a speech in 1898, only through homes that a people can, can become really good and truly great Improvement of homes brings the light of knowledge and the following of the gospel of cleanliness by showing the best ways to sweep, dust, cook, wash and iron and rearing children. So there was a purpose for these women to meet. And it's usually not known to most of us in the United States. I agree, agree with Elaine Apter when she gave her, her very uh, thorough synopsis of history at that time. I'm just adding a little bit more to the story because I do realize that we don't get that information in schools today. So I hope this helps people think about these issues a lot more in depth. And what did the NAAC, NACWC do about suffrage? Well, first NACWC president, Mary Church Jarrell was very active in the civil rights and human rights movement until her death in 19. 54, right after the Brown v. Board of Education Supreme Court decision. And NACWC member Sarah J. Garnett was a founder of the Equal Suffrage League in Brooklyn, New York, the only colored organization in Brooklyn representing the cause of equal rights. As I mentioned earlier, Ida B. Wells Barnett was president of the Alpha Suffrage Club in Chicago, and they educated the community about candidates and local issues that appeared on the ballot. In 1906, the Colorado State Federation of Colored Women's Clubs met in Denver at their convention, where the discussion revolved around the role of colored, women's, colored women voters. And at that convention, Elizabeth Piper Ensley delivered an address entitled Women and the Ballot. So uh, they were very committed to working for the equal, equal suffrage movement, even though they weren't able to participate in the organizations. And this made them... They, they did realize in 1920, they would not be able to vote because it was focused on white women, but you know, it enabled them to push forward until 1965 when they achieved voting through the voting rights, the Equal Voting Rights Act of 1965. And I'm going to end this by a quick story about why I vote. You know, it's been very important in my family. I was telling someone yesterday about a time when I was actually in a car accident and I, it was on election day and I was so concerned about voting. I went to the hospital. It was only a minor injury to my foot, but I did have crutches. I wasn't really able to walk, but uh, my partner who came and picked me up, I really talked him into dropping me off at the voting booth so I could vote before I went home and put my feet up. And I think that we should always remember that people died for us to have the right to vote, especially African-Americans, and we should never take it for granted and always make sure we get out there and use that vote. And thank you very much for having me. Thank you so much, Jan. Um, I think we could all take um, 
that personal story to heart. Um, we just need to figure out a way to get to the ballots, whether it's a mail-in ballot, whether we're standing in line for hours and hours, that vote is important. Um, our next artist is uh, Rosa. And um, Rosa, I'm gonna let you tell the panel and attendees uh, a little bit more about your work as well. Hello, I, I'm Rosa Vera. And first of all, I wanted to thank everyone who's worked and I know they've worked very, very hard putting this wonderful show together. I went to the show and saw it in person. And I have to say, I was very impressed with the quality, the strength and the passion that so many of these paintings showed. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about my painting and also about why I think it's so important for us as women and as US citizens to vote. I, uh, I wanted to use the saying, uh, the expression of Benito Juarez, who was a famous Mexican uh, patriot who, and also who defended, particularly defended native people's rights in Mexico. He said, I can say it in Spanish and then I'll say it in English, el derecho, el, el respeto de a los otros es la paz. Uh, and in English, peace and unity come from the respect to the rights of others. This is a paraphrase of Benito Juarez and much of the disunity in this country comes from people feeling that their rights are threatened. During the 50s and 60s in the US, men and whites had more rights than women and minorities. To, today, some people wish to go back to these times. I want to think that our civil rights have improved and expanded since then. Nevertheless, we have a long way to go to achieve the goal of all people treated with equal rights. We should not want to go back. My painting of We Are Many and One depicts inclusivity. In the group of three women, one has her back turned while another reaches out to catch her attention and turns to the single figure in the corner of the painting. The numbers on the sides of the painting are to bring attention to the fact that we are many. I came to this country at the age of three and became an American citizen in 2011. One of the reasons I did so was due in part of for my fear that is as a resident alien, if I spoke my mind, I could get into trouble. It is time to, to speak up and vote. Voting is the most important part of citizenship so that all our voices can be heard. We must fight for this right and ensure that all are included. The late Ruth Bader Ginsburg fought for equal rights for women and LGBTQs in the workplace and under the law. She often quoted Justice Louis Brandeis's famous line, the greatest menace to freedom is an inert people. And she advised people to fight for the things you care about, but to do it in a way will that will lead others to join you. Of Justice Ginsburg, former US attorney and law professor jo Joyce said, we should honor the life of RBG, American hero, by refusing to give in, refusing to back down, fighting for the civil rights of all people and demanding our leaders honor the rule of law. This is our fight now. And I just wanted to say I'm wearing a vote, your life depends on it t-shirt. Thank you. And I'll send this back to Sandra. Love your t-shirt. Thank you for that. <laughs> um, the last artist that we have um, to speak about her work is um, Andrea McCluskey. And I was really, really struck um, very personally about this piece. So. Um, we're really, really glad to have this included. And Andrea, um, you're up. Thank you so much, Sandra. Thank you to the artists, the other artists and organizers of the exhibition. I'm so excited to be a part of this group. I just uh, have been getting um, uh, tingles listening to everybody's talk. Um, so my piece is entitled First Aid Stuff, Stuff the Ballot Box. And um, I wanted to talk a little bit 
about how I, um, how I came to this point, actually. Um, when I was 13 years old, that's when the Democrat, the 68 Democratic um, Convention was happening. And I was watching um, all the protesters being beaten in the streets. And I also, right after that, um, remember the Kent State shootings of the young people who were murdered on that hill in Kent State. At the same time, while living in Annapolis, I saw the Black Panther Party come into town and help feed the children there. And at the same time, I was reading the op-ed pages um, of the newspaper where they were vilified. So I was uh, sort of becoming a political age then. Uh, also, I saw the retaking of Wounded Knee by the First Nations peoples here. And then after that, there was the move on um, bombing of um, the move house in Philadelphia. So all of these things were, um, were part of my upbringing, part of my political understanding of um, the United States and how things weren't as settled as some of my other um, white friends thought because their lives weren't impacted in the same way as some of you know, my black friends and also my First Nation friends were um, affected in the same way. So um, I found the first aid box. And when I did at the same time, I got my primary ballots in. And so I was looking at these, um, these uh, elements of the piece that finally came together. And um, it, I don't know if you can really see it here in the slide, but um, the um, ballots are printed on very ethereal thin paper. And I wanted it. Um, the piece to convey to people looking at it that it's such a fragile um, thing that we have in our hands right now, especially with all of the um, attacks on, on um, our voting by mail and, and making us feel insecure about our ability to vote, vote. And then at the same time, when I was putting the piece together, there was, um, people were um, using their cell phone cameras to um, make videos, make manifest these acts of violence against um, black um, men and women in our society. So the Black Lives um, Matters, Matter issues were coming to fore at the same time. And I was seeing all of this going on. So at the same time, as this was going on, of course, we have the pandemic underlying all of this. So again, some of this is history repeating itself. And yet I wanted to focus on, I put three band-aids on the box and one of them is for the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act. There was another band-aid for the Justice for Breonna Taylor Act and the John R. Lewis um, Voting Rights Act. Now today, uh, since putting this piece together, of course, there could be so many Band-Aids. Um, looking at all the pieces in the show, when I had the opportunity to go down and view the show and see it online, there are so many issues. And um, I'd like to end just by saying how um, all these issues, all of our issues brought together in this um, beautiful and powerful art um, show allows it's going to allow the voters who are coming to um, the Bora Arts Center um, to see uh, and reflect on all of the issues that are at stake and how voting really matters. And thank you so much for having me and I'll throw it back to Sandra. Sandra, thank you. So um, if we can bring all the, um, kind of bring this all together like I said, when I started thinking about this back in 2018, I had no idea that we would be in a pandemic or um, we would see the death of so many African American um, individuals happening within this time frame. I just knew it was really, really important to include all of our individual voices and reasons on why it was so important to vote and to have the celebration for the 19th Amendment. There's probably going to be more stuff happening. There's more things to be coming. There's more reasons to vote even, even before getting this exhibit 
pull together. And um, I really, really want to say thank you so, so much to all of the participants today on the panel. I want to say uh, a huge, huge thank you for the artists who submitted work. And again, as Anne had mentioned before, whether your work was accepted or not accepted, the fact that you participated in this is just like voting. We've got to participate. We've got to get our vote out there. As individuals, we can make a, a major difference as, as a collective group. Um, if we have time for questions, I, I know we're running a little bit over. Um, let me see if there's anything that's uh, pulling up in questions. Um, I do want to ask the artists, as you had originally gotten the work in prior to um, a lot of this unfolding, we were just learning about COVID in February and March. I know my work was already done for this exhibit. And I think had I had a chance to do another piece to submit, um, how I would have been affected, how my work would have been affected knowing all the things that we know right now. So if anybody wants to, um, any of the artists want to expand um, on that question, did you find your work changing in this current environment? I can talk on that a little bit um, because it actually did change that the piece between prayer and protest was not the original piece that I created to um, exhibit in this in this um, collection. So poor Mary, I just said, please give me a little bit of time because it just felt so critical that I express what was happening in the moment, um, not just for other people, but literally just for me as an artist. Um, so yeah, you got a completely different piece. Excellent. I know for me, the piece that I have in called um, Equal Pay, unfortunately, um, we're probably seeing even more of an impact when it comes to pay equity. Um, if you are a mom and you're working from home and you have young children that keep jumping into your Zoom meetings and your boss is telling you to figure it out, um, my piece became even more important, I felt from myself individually, that that pay equity was like loud and clear again that we were still missing missing out um, in addition to the piece called 82 cents you know that was again a, a, a work of art that was speaking to that pay inequity um lily i know you had mentioned your work um you really really described that very well on how um, current environment had changed um and how your piece showed um let me see if I can grab another question. Um, let me jump in and see how my, my team is doing here. Um, do we have any questions from Facebook Live? Um, I wasn't able to see anything yet. If anybody wants to put in our chat. Um, I'll ask this one question of Jan and Elaine, um, and uh, hopefully they have time to, to comment. Um, if you've had a chance to see the work virtually, um, was there any one piece that stood out or was there anything that you saw that was a collective theme that maybe you wanted to, to share? Uh, no, I saw it virtually. I. I'm hoping to see it in real life. I thought it was outstanding and, and the, um, the variety of things that you bring into voting and the situation today was amazing. Um, it just wasn't get out the vote, everybody vote. I mean, and there was such power behind some of the, um, some of the pieces. I was very, very impressed. I, I would agree with that. I, I was only able to see it virtually and the colors that were used, the themes that were addressed, I was really surprised to see information about the environmental themes. I thought it would focus mostly on voting. Mm -hmm. So I was happy to see some other things included with that. And 
all the pieces told a story. So I thought it was a fantastic exhibit. Right. I, I really think it it really proves that voting is more just casting your vote. It's it's what happens after that vote and the power that you've given for the environment and for health care and for women's rights and things. Um, and that's what you're showing is it's not just checking a box. Excellent. And um, another question for Jan, um, do you see a single issue that's important for African-American women right now or women of color that you see um, that's really, really imperative for this election? Oh boy, that's like a loaded question. <laughs> there are so many. I don't even think you could pick one. Uh, I, you know, we forget about the equal pay because while with your piece, Sandra, it's 82 cents, but that's not true for African American and Hispanic or Latinx women. They make even less than that, more on the range of 60 to 60. Five cents per dollar. So that's definitely at the top of my list. And with a lot of people being first, you know, caregivers and first time first responders because of where they work in hospitals and CNAs and, and things like that, they are definitely suffering more with the pandemic than most people are. Um, there's there's so many things that we could address with that question. It's lots of different answers. I Excellent. just hope everybody votes on November 3rd. Yes. Excellent. Um, my next question is actually for Mary. And um, she, she's like, what? <laughs> uh, um, we had talked a little bit about um, having the exhibit at Bora Park. And um, in this current environment we're in, how much of a concern did you have that maybe we wouldn't be able to put the show together at Boer Park. Well, actually, there was that we're very lucky to have this uh, exhibit at Boer Park because, as we know, in the state of Maryland, Montgomery County was one of the counties that was greatest hit by the pandemic and is not as open as other countries, uh, as other counties in the in the state. And luckily, uh, the city of Gaithersburg did open uh, at the community center Boer Park. Um, 30, 37 people are allowed in the building at one time at this point, which is great. It's a large building, and so it's pretty safe to go view the exhibit. Uh, but even putting up the exhibit, as Sandra knows, she, she was with me to put up the exhibit. It, it's, we are in a pandemic, and we, there is no joke. I mean, we wore gloves, we wore masks. Um, uh, but it, it's, it couldn't be a more vital and important exhibit. And uh, I'm just thrilled that we were able to have this opportunity. And there will be early voting at Bora Park for the city of Gaithersburg, the biggest venue in the city for voting. And there will be voting on November 3rd. So this is a very, many, many people will see this show. I'm very happy about that. Did you run into any limitations on what could be shown or what maybe we were um, edited to, to not be able to show. As a city, we have uh, certain restrictions uh, for the community. We, we said there was, we, we would, did not want any images that had to do with po uh, 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 political personages that were super highlighted in, in politics. We didn't think that would be a good idea. And we wanted to just focus on the issues at hand. We tried our hardest to be as inclusive as we could with the artists. Uh, and that's why we decided to make an invitational show as well, because we wanted to make sure that we had a broad range of women artists who were showing. And we didn't know when you do a jury show if that will happen. I think I would have liked to have even had more time to do more of that. But um, overall, I think it, it worked out well. And um, I'm going to leave a, one more question for Anne, and then I think we'll probably will be closing out the session. But Anne, did you, I know you went into detail with a lot of the work that was being shown, mm -hmm. but was there an overall theme that you were specifically looking for as a juror, or was there an overall theme that sort of came across that maybe you didn't get a chance to highlight? No, I, um, I think that, um, it's always different for um, during exhibitions, you know, sometimes the 
criteria is very specific, um, but obviously for, for this exhibit, there was such a, a wide open um, range of solutions that were submitted that um, I think in just looking at the work and considering, you know, the quality of the work as, you know, the crafted, crafted piece itself um, probably was the, the main criteria. And then looking at the appropriateness for, for the theme that, that was set for, for the show and how the, the piece would address that. Excellent. So I, um, if we can bring up the last slide that has some of the um, information about the exhibit. Um, again, we have in-person showing at the uh, Activity Center at Borough Park in Gaithersburg, Maryland. If you're familiar with where Gaithersburg High School is on 355, it's right across the, the parking lot, so to speak. Um, if you go to wcadc.org, you can see the exhibit in um, the slideshow there, as well as a virtual reality type of an exhibit. Um, but we really, really encourage you um, by wearing your mask, please go to the location to see the work in person. You really cannot get the same impact on seeing it virtually as you can in person. And I really, really encourage that. Um, again, why I vote, I, I absolutely as an individual citizen encourage each and every one of us to go out to vote. And again, whether that's in person, ballot, drop it off at the, the, the ballot box, whether you have to go stand in line, whatever it takes. Um, we want to make sure that our voice is heard. And um, I think that concludes our session for today. If there's anybody else that has some last remarks, again, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you so much to everybody who has participated. Okay.